All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Right. Given our definition, so in our last lecture, we discussed some basics of number theory. Right? We talked about the divide function, modulus function, and some basic properties of integers with respect to these operators. And so now we can properly define a few things, including our prime numbers. And so we'll start off with the primes. Right? Again, a lot of this number theory, prime numbers, et cetera, right? these concepts are used a lot in, in various computer science applications, including hash functions, which we talked about last uh, course ciphers, encryption, security, and so on. Right? We'll look at a few more applications when we get back from break as well. All right, so we'll define a prime as a positive, a positive integer p, right? if the only positive factors are 1 and p. Right? So prime and positive integer p is prime And if the only positive factors of P are 1 and P. Right, an integer that is right, a positive integer. That is not prime. Right, it's called composite. And so our definition of prime and composite numbers. I note that one is not considered a prime number given this definition, and p and one are distinct. Right, given this right, definition of primes, right, we can now properly define our, our state, our fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Right. This is the theorem that underlies all of number theory in large part. Right. The fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Credit for this has been given to Euclid. Uh, you can find the, the basics of this theorem right, in sort of the, the historical text, the elements, right, U, Euclid's uh, concatenation of, of 13 books, right, which states you know, a large history of, of mathematics. All right, uh, one, of these, one of the basic principles mentioned in these, in these texts is this, the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And right, for every positive integer, greater than one. I should just say every positive integer greater than one, sorry, can be written uniquely as a prime or the product of two or more primes. Right. This fundamental theorem of arithmetic is also referred to as uh, the prime factorization theorem. Right, the fact that we can write out each number uniquely as a product of primes. Yeah. Are they, are they unique primes? The primes are not unique. The 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 prime factorization is unique for each number. Right. So you could have two times two, for example, would be four. All right, we can do a few examples uh, like this. Right? In fact, you have a few examples to do for your homework where you're asked to uh, mention the prime factorization or prime expansion, right? sometimes also called right, for, uh, for five different numbers, I think, in your homework. 
right here we can do an example. Right, we can write out right, 512 as a product of primes. Right, this is 2 times 2 times 2, 9 times. Right. 512 is the only number that has this prime factorization. If you multiply 2 times itself 9 times, you will get 512 and 512 alone. Right. Similarly, and 14 is equal to 2 times 7. Again, this is unique to 14. Right? This prime factorization has one result. It is 14. Right? 13 simply equal to 13. Right? Each number can be represented as a product of primes or one prime alone if itself is prime. If it itself is prime. Right. Any questions about prime factorization? All right, we also have right, another interesting consequence here. We'll call this theorem. Right, we won't refer to this. We can call this theorem or a corollary, really. Okay, so if n right, is a composite integer, right, then N has a prime divisor. Right, that is less than or equal to the square root of N. And intuitively, this makes sense. If you took N right, and multiplied it times itself, you would get N. And, or, excuse me, if you took the square root of n, multiplied it times itself, you would get n. Right? If n had another prime divisor, right, it would have to be, or let's just take the two different cases. If they had a divisor that was less than the square root of n, right, then you would multiply a number that's greater than the square root of n to get n. Right? This should be fairly clear as the square root of n times the square root of n. Is n right? Also, as a follow-up of that particular case, if it had a prime divisor that was less, that was greater than the square root of n, Right. If you multiplied a number that was greater than the square root of n times that number, you would get a number that's greater than it. Right. So the other factor right, would have to be less than the square root of n, right. just the sort of the informal sketch of how you would draw out that proof. Right. So note as a result for this, right, we can significantly reduce right, a time complexity for searching right, for factors of a particular number. Right. In previous exercises in our class, right, you guys wrote algorithms, or as a group we wrote algorithms to search to see whether a number was prime by searching all integers starting at 2 up to that particular number. Right? However, in fact, we only needed to search numbers starting at 2 going up to the square root of n. So we could have constrained that search significantly right? as, as a follow-up to this particular theorem. As if a number is composite, right, it must have a factor that is less than or equal to, the square, to its square root. Right. So again, we can do a quick example. Let's show. Right, that 31 is prime. Right, so again, in a very naive way, we could simply start at 2 and search all the way up till 30 and see if any of these numbers divide 30. Right, however, we can note here right, that the square root of 36, or, or 31, is, is going to be less than the square root of 36. Right, the square root of 36, right? equal to 6. So we need only search up to, to 6 to confirm that this number is prime. Right, so does 2 divide 31? Right, nope. All right, to also note that our divisor, is, given our theorem, is going to be prime, so we need only check the prime number. So if we have a list of prime numbers up to the square root of the number we're checking, we need only search those numbers so we can even further reduce the numbers that we are searching right, uh, to determine whether a number is prime or not. Can you explain one more time why you search the prime numbers? Right, uh, given our previous theorem, right, uh, the theorem we just wrote, if n is a composite, a composite integer, then n has a prime divisor that is less than or equal to the square root of n. Right? So we need only check prime numbers to see if it divides right, this particular number to determine whether, the num whether n is composite or not. 
right? If we have a list of prime numbers, right, then we need only search this list, right, rather than simply all the integers. Right? All right, three is also a prime, right? We see that three does not divide 31 as well, right? We need not check four, right? As four is composite, if four divided 31, two would have divided 31. Right? This is why we need only check the prime numbers. Right, five is prime, right? We can see that five does not divide 31. Right, six is not prime, we do not need to check six. Right, and six is, is greater than the square root of 31. And so we can stop our search here and conclude that 31 is prime. All right, in your homework, you're asked to identify five composite numbers and five prime numbers. Right, you can convince yourself however you like. I encourage you to go ahead and write out these steps while you're convincing yourself, just to make sure that, that you understand and um, for the purposes of, of understanding the concept so that when you go to the, the test, you can uh, also you know, exhibit that you do understand the concept. All right, so how many primes are there? Right, to move on. There are an infinite number of primes. Right? We will prove this now. All right, before we do this proof, we'll do a, a similar proof that is a little bit easier to just sort of give you intuition as to, as to how the proof works and why it works. All right. All right, so we'll do a little side note here. All right, previously in this class, we discussed the natural numbers, the set of the natural numbers, and by definition, we called them, we declared that they were countably infinite. Right? However, we did not formally prove that they were actually infinite. Right, so we can go ahead and do a proof sketch, right? We'll just sort of sketch it out and show that the natural numbers are indeed infinite, right? right proofs of this sort, right? Again, trying to handle infinite and uh, numbers and sets that are infinite, it's hard to do in a closed form fashion, right? So in general, whenever you're presented with a proof of this nature, you'll, you'll likely use a proof by contradiction. Right, or some sort of indirect proof. <coughs> and so we'll assume that our statement is false and in hope, hopefully we'll reach a contradiction, thus showing that it is true. And again, the, the nature of a proof by contradiction. All right. All right, so complementing our statement that n is infinite, right, we would then say, we will assume that n is finite. And along this path, we're going to, number one, assume the complement of what it is we're trying to prove. So we're going to assume that n is finite. Then we're going to write an exhaustive list of all of the elements in n. And then we're going to create a natural number that is not in n. All right, I'm sorry, that is not in our, our exhaustive list of n, thus showing that, right, thus reaching a contradiction. All right. All right, so n, right, again, just reminding you, n is the natural numbers. Right, 0, 1, 2, right, all of the non-negative integers, actually, right? right? If we assume that it's finite, right, then the cardinality, right, there exists an n such that the cardinality of n, right, is equal to n. The definition of a finite set is that right, we have the cardinality equal to n. Right. Right, given this, we can right, list out our n elements. And right, so again, if n, cardinality of n is equal to n, right, then we can list out our n elements. Right, we'll call it, right, we'll call them x0, x1, x2, dot, 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 xn. All 
right? Using the well ordering principle, right? The well ordering principle notes that we can order these this set of numbers using the less than, right, or equal to operator. And given the well ordering principle, right, we can order these elements. So we'll assume that this is in order such that we have a max element. Right, we must therefore have a max element. Right, if we're starting at zero, we have an n minus first element if we have n total elements. So we'll say our max element is x n minus one. Right, assuming that we put them in order using the less than operator. Right, again, this is a, a proof sketch. It's a little informal, but I think the, the intuition is there. Right, so we have our set of numbers. We've ordered them. Right, we have n elements. We have a max element if we order these elements using the less than operator. Seemed reasonable? Right, we have a maximum element, yeah. Right. We have a, a we have a, a set of, of integers here, right? And so we can put them in order using the less than operator, just intuitively, right? The formal reason why we can do this is due to the well ordering principle, the well order. Right, uh, the non-negative integers can be ordered, essentially. Right? They can be put in order. Right? Since they can be put in order, we have a max element. This max element is x to the sub n minus 1. Right? If we have n elements starting at 0, right, we put them in order. So the, the last one we'll say is the max element. Right? We've just put them in that order, so it's, such that they're ordered. All right? All right, again, since we have n elements, right, we have an exhaustive list here of all of the elements. Right. However, we can create a new number that is a non-negative integer that is not in this list. Right. Essentially, we can create, what shall we use? We can create a number y that is equal to x to the n minus 1 plus 1. Right. If you add two integers, you will get an integer. We've added 1 to this integer. You get a new integer. It's greater than the maximum number in this list that we've ordered. Right. Therefore, this number is not in the list. Our list was not exhaustive. We reach a contradiction. Right, so our assumption was false. The assumption was that these the natural numbers are finite. So we can conclude that the natural numbers are not finite, not that they are infinite. <coughs> right, so the reason I, I sort of did this proof was that it's, it's a, a, fairly, a fairly straightforward proof of uh, how a set might be infinite, right? Uh, if you can order the, the values or order the numbers in the set. Right, our, our proof for there being an infinite number of primes is along the same lines here. And so I thought this would be a good way to introduce uh, this proof style first before going into our proof of prime numbers. All right? any questions about this proof? Again, we, we listed out all of our, our, our uh, non-negative integers. Right? We assumed that we could put them in order right, using a, the less than operator. Right? We can therefore conclude we have a maximum element in this set. Right, if we assume that if we add two integers, we get another integer. Right, if we add one to this maximum element, we get a larger element. Right, however, this was the maximum maximum element in the list. Therefore, we've created an integer not in the list, thus reaching a contradiction. Good. All right. All right. So let's get back to our proof of primes. So the primes are infinite. All right, again, we will do this proof by contradiction. All right, again, our basic idea here is similar. We're going to, since we're doing a proof by contradiction, we're going to say that the primes are finite. We're going to create an exhaustive list of the primes, and then we are going to create a number right, that is prime that is not in this list. Right. Creating a, a number that is prime directly in this fashion is difficult, so we're going to indirectly create a prime number that's not in this list. All right, so assume that we have, all right, so we're going to assume, again, proof by contradiction, assume 
right? The primes are finite. And again, this means that there exists an n such that the cardinality of this set is n, so we have n primes, right? So we can list them out, p1, p2, p3, all the way out to pn. Right, so now here's a sort of a note to self now. Right, we create right, a prime that is not in this set or not in this list. Right, thus reaching a contradiction. All right, so we will very cleverly construct a queue. And such that Q is equal to the product of all of these primes. And that is P1 times P2 times P3 dot 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 times Pn plus 1. And we can write this a little bit more densely. It's simply the product right, of I goes from 1 to N of Pi, right, and then plus 1. Why did we construct Q in this fashion? Well, because of our fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And so because of our fundamental theorem of arithmetic, right, Q can be represented as a product of primes right, or as one prime alone. And so again, by the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, And Q can be represented by a product of primes or a single prime. Right, another way of saying this is that there exists there exists some PJ right, that divides Q. Right, that is, PJ is, is either Q itself right, or some prime factor of Q. Yeah. Right, so this is going to help us reach our contradiction. I'm getting there. Right. This isn't necessarily that representation, clearly. Right. right. Since we have an exhaustive list here, the product of all of the primes, right? Pj must be in this list, in this product. Right. Pj was, must be one of these p's, given our assumption. Right. So let's look at this. And so let's look at q here. All right, so again, since Q is equal to P1 times P2 dot, 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 times Pn plus 1, right? if Pj divides Q, right, right, it must divide right, this portion of Q and this portion of Q. Right? Clearly, if Pj is in this list, it will divide the product of all of our primes here. Right. However, in order for PJ to divide Q, PJ must also divide 1. Right. 
the only number that will divide one is one, which is not prime. All right, so this is, so PJ is not in our list. All right, so PJ is a prime. <coughs> not in our exhaustive list, right? It is either, it is a prime factor of Q, right? Or it is Q itself, right? In either case, it is not in our list of primes, right? Therefore, we reach a contradiction, yes? This was our clever way to produce a number, right? Such that we could such that we could construct a prime or define a prime PJ such that it does not divide this number. And so we had our exhaustive list of primes, right? And we knew if we took the product of all those primes and then added one to it, right? That by the definition of the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, that a prime must exist that divides Q, right? It's either Q itself or a factor of Q, right? And by adding one to this product of primes, right? We indirectly create this prime PJ that is not in our exhaustive list. Any other prime? It couldn't be another prime number as um, as our list was exhaustive. So I suppose you could add that prime number if you wanted to. Right. However, constructing that number would not help us reach the contradiction because we could then choose that prime number to divide. Right. How we reach the contradiction is by choosing one there, adding one to this number. Right, forcing a number that divides Q to be a number that also divides one. Right, right, right. Yeah, in order to reach the contradiction, right, we construct it this way. I see a question. Yes. Yeah. It does not matter whether Q is. Yeah, we are not. We have not proven that Q is prime. Here. We've we've shown that there exists a PJ that is prime and not in our list. Yes. Yeah, so in this instance, Q may be prime or it may not be prime. Right? We do not have to prove Q itself is prime for this proof. Right? Yeah. I understand that when you were um, doing the earlier proof of the natural numbers, you were trying to show us a number. But mm -hmm. would it be like possible to prove that the natural numbers are infinite using that technique we use for like the upper bounding function? With the i's, like the i plus one. So if like i is in the infinite set, then i plus one would be in the infinite set. Yeah. So if i, uh, yeah. So you could, you could in a sense convince yourself that, that if you keep adding one to an integer, you're going to create an element that is in the set. Right. Right. If if from that statement you you can therefore conclude that the set is infinite, then, uh, then it's true. It's, you couldn't necessarily directly. Right? Uh, I think it's easier to do in terms of finite. Right? The definition of an infinite set is one that is not finite. Right? Therefore, you need to show that it's not finite. It's probably the most the, the clearest way to show that a set is infinite. Right. Okay. Yeah. But otherwise, you can, it's very intuitive to use you know, sort of the principle of induction to convince yourself that the set would be right, infinite. All right. Any other questions about uh, about the proof here? So we have a finite set, and the primes are, are, are excuse me, we have an infinite set. The, the primes are infinite. There are an infinite number of them. Right, so we'll introduce one more group of prime numbers, right, the Mersenne primes, right, and then we'll take a break. And so Marin Mersenne, French mathematician, it's really more of a clergyman who did some dabbling in, in number theory and acoustics. And, it's, and there's a group of primes named after him, Mersenne primes. Right, these are primes of the following form, 2 to the p minus 1, where p is prime. Right, so Mersenne primes right, are primes in the form this. 
It's a, simply because we have a prime number and we take two to that number and subtract one does not necessarily mean that the number is going to be prime, but a Mersenne prime is a prime number that can be represented in this form. All right, an example of a Mersenne prime would be three. Wait, two to the two, yeah. Right, because we have two to the two minus one. Right, also seven is equal to two to the three minus one. Our same primes are of particular importance, right, as there is a, a fairly efficient way to check to see whether a number of this form is prime or not. Right, and for this reason, and maybe a few other interesting uh, notes related to number theory, uh, Mersenne numbers and Mersenne primes are uh, are interesting and significant, right? To sort of pique your interest here, I also have very recently, not last month, but I think in January this year, there was a, a brief write-up in either Nature or Science, right? They have just found right the latest Mersenne prime number. Right, there's a constant search going on, search for prime numbers. Right, the Mersenne search search is of uh, particular interest as. Right, as again, the check for Mersenne primes is, is efficient, fairly efficient. Right? It's the uh, Lucas Lemmer test, right, which relies on many of the theorems of number theory that we've gone over right, in class. Let's pull up this website here for everyone. Right, and can you guys see that okay? No, no, you can't. Let's make it a little bit bigger. Right, so if you go to mersenne.org, Right, you can see here the website for the great internet search for Mersenne primes. Right, and so just recently they found the newest Mersenne prime number. Right, there's only been 49 found. Right? Many conjecture that there are an infinite number of Mersenne primes. However, this has never been proven. This is an open problem. Right, every single time somebody finds a Mersenne prime, they get an award of $3,000. You're welcome to join the Mersenne prime search. Right? You can follow these instructions if you wish. Right. The one that was found was this number here, which is a shockingly large number. It's actually inconceivable probably for humans to understand the size of this number. Right. This is 2 to the 74 million and something, and then minus 1. Right. So right, this is a, the 74 million number is, is a prime number as well, but the Mersenne prime is 2 to the 74 million, et cetera, minus 1. Right. To, under, to again, to put this in context about concerning the size of this number, I think the, the estimated number of particles in the known universe or atoms in the known universe is maybe like two to the hundred, something like that. So, and we have a physicist in here, maybe, maybe, they, maybe uh, you could correct me with that number, but I think that's, it's on the order of that. So this number is quite large. It is, it is uh, again, inconceivable for most of us. It has 22 million digits, right, which is, yeah. You know, Again, a very large number. And so if you think about how you would do a, a check for this, to check to see whether this number is prime or not, right? it's fairly clear that we didn't check all the numbers starting at 2 up to this number. We also didn't check all the numbers starting at 2 and going to the square root of this number either. Right? In fact, there is a, a more efficient method to check Mersenne prime numbers. Right? Uh, let's see. There's some interesting information here, again, if this sort of thing piques your interest. Here are the known Mersenne primes. Right? And so this search started back in about 500 BC, right? Again, since 500 BC, we found 49 of these numbers. Again, we, it's assumed that we have an infinite number of them, right? right? Recently, we've only found a few, and you know, it it takes us pretty long to find them. Here, so here's 49. We found it this year, right? Again, this very large, uh, very large number. If you were to plot out when we find each of these numbers here, here's a plot of the year and the actual number itself. Right. It had been about two years since the, the previous Mersenne prime was found. Right. And then two years before that, right, in 2013, the previous Mersenne number was found. Right. Right. This, right. There's also a number here. Let's see how long it, take, it took to find these particular numbers. Right. So this particular number itself, to verify that this particular number itself, using you know, our very efficient algorithm to check to see whether Mersenne primes right, are, uh, are prime or not, or Mersenne number is prime or not, right, it took, uh, I think, 57 days to check this particular number 
right on a on a fairly fast computer. Uh, where's all that information? Yeah, so I think, yeah, so here it is in gigahertz days, right? And this is the most recent update. So every hour they send out an update for every single number they check and clear, and they're like, okay, this is a composite number. If you're in the search, you don't have to check this number anymore. All right, so there's always a running uh, running report and, uh, and, and sort of this, this huge search for the Mersenne primes. All right, we can go ahead and take a two, three minute break here. And uh, we'll go ahead and pick back up right, with greatest common divisors and the Euclidean algorithm. Hey, how's it going? Okay, thank you. Why are you doing so Show the numbers time. We just go through what we said. We just go through what we talked about after class, making sure. And just, oh, like, just, and just go through all the the prime time. numbers, right? Less than or equal to the square root. That makes sense. Okay, and then I just wanted to talk to you. I have a plus one, so it's okay if I leave the class. Oh, sure. And uh, we just have homework too for uh, next week. Almost. Yeah, I think uh, Wednesday, right? Wednesday. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, and then it's why is this the thing? I thought it was really like and I tried well funny, I like I tried it. The only thing I'm thinking that you could do I don't know if you have to use this one, I don't know, like that one kind of looks like you might have to use it. I don't know. Give me a hint, I'm a transitive property of divides. Yeah, so where uh, how far did where are you at again? So I multiplied them all out and then I tried doing it but then and then I realized when I faxed it again I was just getting back to this point. So I like I Taken out A and gotten C minus D, but then I was like, oh, that's exactly where I was at. But I took out C. So that wasn't the right method, but because the, the thing of it, I know you have to do this, I know you have to do this. So this, this is essentially what this is saying. So this is the only point we need to get to. And I know you can get to AC by just doing that, but I don't think somebody, then the issue back here. Oh, wait, no, no, no. Hold on, I still think. I don't Awesome. I can't just like that's so great. Yeah, because I can't take out. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I because I feel like. Is there like a hair on this one? No, no, I don't think there's a hair on this one. Like, like, I will give you a hint to, to you can um, go in uh, which section of this. So if you, check your, if you check the text, I think they'll give you a hint yeah. as for for which property to use to complete Okay, so you think it's one of these properties that should say goodbye. All right, all right, sounds good. Thank you. Thank you. Awesome. Sorry. There's like me and that 
Is this step like really necessary? Because you can get to this step right here just based on this. So if you know this, this you can just go to this step right here. Like, is this, thing, is this step right here all important? Because you can get right here. Just by well, using this. Well, right, clearly. I mean, that's all you are using. Is this, the, all the intermediate yeah. steps are just steps to make it clear. That okay, yes. so, uh, so you need to make it clear, however, that it's okay. so if you can explain it using words, or explain it using, you know, some other type of uh, okay. arithmetic or, or other properties that we've learned, you can certainly use those too. Okay, so this just makes it clear. I, I mean, all of this, all of this falls out simply because of the premise. I mean, just yeah, yeah. yeah, and because of this. Okay. All right, guys, so we'll go ahead and uh, pick back up here uh, with uh, GCD and LCD. Right, so GCD is the greatest common divisor, right? And LC, ah, LCM, excuse me, least common multiple. Right, very closely related to this topic as well. All right, so we can define the greatest common divisor, GCD, as follows. So let A and B be integers that are non-zero. The largest D, right, such that D divides A and D divides B, is called the greatest common divisor of A and B. Right, so this is a, an integer d that divides both a and b. This is the largest such of those integers, the greatest or largest common divisor of a and b. a and b are called relatively prime if their greatest common divisor is 1. That is, they have no common factors, save 1. And so let's do an example. I'll let you guys finish writing that. A and, a and B are like and A and B are not uh, are integers that are not Z. They can be negative. Yeah, just non-zero, non-zero integers. All the integers, but zero. All right, so let's do an example. All right, so let's find the greatest common divisor, right, the GCD of 48 and 84. All right, so if you want to try to find the greatest common divisor, again, you're looking for the largest factor that divides both of these numbers. 
one good way to, to try to identify such a factor would be to start off by writing the prime number expansion or the unique prime factorization of each of the numbers. And so we can look at 48, right? If we take the prime factorization of 48, we'll see that we get 2 to the 2 and times 3 times 7. And it's going to be 21 times 4. Oops. <laughs> Sorry, that's 21 times 4. That's 84. Sorry about that. And we'll do 48 here. Equal to 2 to the 4 times 3. All right, this is 8, 16. Yeah, 16 and 3. My arithmetic is just really poor. All right. All right, so to find the greatest common divisor right, of these, right, of these, we want to find the largest integer d that divides both of these numbers. All right, so how could we find such a divisor? Well, a common factor here, if we just look at the prime factorizations, we would see that, what, well, 3 divides both. All right, so we know 3 is a common divisor, right, but it's not going to be the largest, it's not the greatest common divisor, but 3 is a common divisor. Right? We also see that 2 divides both, but not just 2, but 2 to the 2 should divide both, right? as 4 will divide both. Right? So here, right, we see that 7 right, is a factor of 84, but not a factor of, um, of 48. Right? And 48 also has a few more products of 2 in here, but such a number will not divide 84, right? any of these even factors that are greater than 4 will not divide 84. All right, so we can see here that the GCD right, is going to be, right, of these two numbers, we'll go ahead and write it out that way. Let's see. And the GCD of 48 and 84 is going to be 2 to the 2 times 3, right, or 12. Right, essentially, what we did here is just identify, right, given our prime factorization of each number, right, the, the factors that divide both, right, all of the factors that divide both of these elements. In general, we can find the GCD in this fashion right, as follows. Notes. Right. The GCD of A and B it can be found right. again we'll define A and B in terms of their prime number expansions or prime factorizations right. we'll say A is equal to we'll list out we'll assume we, we have this list of primes we'll enumerate them as right, P1 Right, to the A1, P2, to the A2. Here A1, A2 are the exponents here of that particular primes with the corresponding subscripts. P3 to the A3, and then dot, dot, dot. Right, we'll assume that there exists some N where we have N is the maximum number of primes that we need to factor out either A or B. P to the N, A to the N. Right, note that this, the, the superscript could be zero in this case if, if one of them has a prime number that's not shared. Yeah. Right. So A1, right? So for example, in our previous, we had two, we right, had uh, 84, right, is equal to two to the two times three to the one times seven to the one. And so we can write them out as simply a product of primes, right, with some superscript. Yeah. Right, B, we can also write out as P to the 1, and then we'll use B to the 1 to indicate the, the superscript for the first prime, right, for our number B. And B2, P3, is B3, dot, 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 PN to the BN. And again, note that it's... Here we're assuming that we have a product of n primes for both of these integers. Right? This is not 
true in the in in cases. For example, in eighty four we had seven, right? But in right for a number forty eight we didn't have seven. But you can always multiply seven to the zero. So these superscripts could be zero. It just changes that prime to one in the product. Okay. Right. So we can write out these two numbers in this fashion. I note that the GCD and of A and B, right, given these prime factorizations, right, is simply equal to right, P to the one, and then superscript, right, the min value of A1 and B1 and times P to the two. And all we're doing is taking the same prime products and then taking the min exponent between A and B right, to the min of A2, E2, dot, 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 right, and then Pn, min of An, comma, Bn. Right, again, looking back to our example, that's exactly what we did. Right, we had 84, right, we had 48, right, this was equal to 2 to the 4 times 3 to the 1. Oops. Right, a note here, given the way we've defined how we're going to expand out A and B here, we have to also write 7 here, but we can just simply make that to the superscript 0, right, which is just times 1. Right, to find the greatest common divisor, we simply identified the common factors right, and took the minimum of the exponents. This will assure that both of the corresponding factors will divide both, will divide both of the numbers A and B. Any questions about that? All right, one more observation about GCD. All right, and this observation will lead us to the Euclidean algorithm. All right, note that right, A is equal to B times some quotient plus some remainder. All right, and this is true for all A, B, and Z. All right, given this, then all right, there exists a Q and an R. Right, when we were defining modulus and dividends uh, and divisors, we uh, we noted this. All right, then we have that GCD of a comma b is equal to the GCD of b comma r. Right, given this, we can now define the Euclidean algorithm. Right? It is an efficient algorithm to find the greatest common divisor of two numbers, two integers. Right. And so we'll define our procedure as GCD. Then we have an A and a B, which we'll assume to be ints. And here, we can just, we'll just assume that they are positive. Depending on how we define R, we could also account for negatives. And then we'll say, X is equal to A, Y gets the value of B, while uh, Y is not equal to zero. So that R is 
The remainder is x mod y. And again, we're computing r because we know that for any two integers a and b, a is equal to b times some quotient plus some remainder. Right, and we will switch y and x, right, and y and r. And we will keep repeating this. So y is equal to zero, and we will return x. Again, this algorithm relies on the fact right, that GCD of a, b is equal to GCD of b, r, right, where a equals b, q plus r. Right. I encourage you guys to step through this algorithm a few times. Uh, as you guys might have seen, I sent out an announcement and an email with a, a set of suggested practice problems for the exam from each of the sections. Right. A few of the ones from this section had to do with just sort of grabbing two integers, plugging it into this algorithm, and checking to see how the algorithm works. Just step through it line by line and see if you get the right answer. I'm sure if we wrote it down right. All right. All right. Next, we'll discuss these common multiples and then integer representations. Will will take us to the end of the class. And so, least common multiples. And these common multiples. least common multiple of A and B it is the smallest let's see such that And A divides C and B divides C. Why we write it out LCM of A and B is equal to C. And we'll do an example. All right, again, to determine the least common multiple, it's, it's easiest for us to simply write out the prime factorization of each of these numbers. And so we can write out 24. So what's the prime factorization of 24? Two to the third times three. Does everyone agree? All right, and for 22, what do we have here? Yep, eleven and two. All right. So, given this, what is a number that both twenty-four and twenty-two will divide, and what is the least number, right? The least integer, the smallest integer that twenty-three, or I'm sorry, that twenty-four and twenty-two will both divide. Right. So to determine this, we need to construct a number using these primes, right, such that both of these products will divide the number. Right. So we can do this by identifying the prime factorization. Right. Rather than finding the min of these exponents of all of the primes, we will find the max, such that each of these numbers will then evenly divide the resulting product. 
And so our LCM, right, 24, 22 will be equal to right, 2 to the 3 times 3 to the 1 times 11 to the 1. Note here, since we chose the maximum of the exponents, right, both this number right, and this number will uh, whoa. Whoa. And note that both this number and this number will divide our resulting product here. And we can construct this least common multiple by again picking the the prime factorizations, right, with the maximum exponent rather than the minimum with GCD. So we can write this out. Right in general with the LCM of A and B. Right where A is equal to again our prime factorization will use the same uh, notation. equal to P1 and then the max of the exponents. Again, this will assure that each A and B, right, both A and B, will divide the resulting product. Right. One more observation. We can compute LCM also using the Euclidean algorithm as follows. Right. The product of A and B right, is equal to the GCD of A comma B times the LCM of A comma B. And so that will wrap up our brief discussion of greatest common divisors and least common multiples. Any questions before we before we move on to integer representation? So the fastest way to find the prime factorization I don't know about the fastest way uh, the, I don't know necessarily a fastest way off the top of my head and you can certainly the, the fastest way would be simply if you had a list of the primes would be to simply just search the primes sequentially starting at 2 right, and going up to, to the square root of n Right, with some assumptions, you might be able to speed up on that, make a speed up on that. How you implement it, whether recursion or iteration, and using kind of tree structure to facilitate recursion or just iteration, is, I think, a good depend on your programming language. But the actual algorithm itself, I think uh, the fastest would be simply to, to go through, or at least without any assumptions in the general case, would be to go through a list of the primes starting at 2, right, if you have a list of the primes. Good question. Any other questions?
right, integer representations. All right, so in general, when we write numbers, we assume base 10, right? We'll write numbers in base 10. And so for example, if we wrote the number 365, right, we read this as 365, right? We call this the, right, what's this first digit? What do we call this generally, right? The ones digit, and this is the ones digit, right? This is the, the tens digit. I'll just write it like this. And this is the hundreds digit. And I'll put a, a subscript 10 here to indicate that this number is base 10. And so this is base 10 representation. Right, there's a reason why we call this the ones digit, the tens digit, and the hundreds digit. Right, because we can write these numbers out in general right, as three times 10 to the two plus six times 10 to the one, plus five times 10 to the zero. And thus our ones digit, our tens digit, and our hundreds digit. Right? When you add this up, we get 365. Note that in general, right, for any positive integer, Right, and any base B, right, this was base 10, but we can do this for any base. Right, we can represent any number uniquely, right, and can be represented uniquely. Right, as Say alpha used as the coefficient, right? Sub k times the base to the k, right? Plus alpha sub k minus one times the base to the k minus one, right? All the way down to our ones digit, right? Which is simply right, alpha to the zero and b to the zero. Right, so again, we can rep we can expand out or represent any number number uniquely using this expansion. The base does not necessarily have to be ten. Right, we can have base right, uh, any integer. This here uh, zero. Right, in computer science, right, we are particularly interested in bases of two. Right. And some multiples of two. Right, so base two we call binary. And base eight, call octal. Right, in base 16, hexadecimal, or hex. All right, we'll do a few examples. All right, again, just simply using all right, our previous observation, all right, we can compute the value of any of these numbers, all right, any of their representations, by expanding it out right, in that polynomial form of alpha, sub k times the base to the k, right? From k equal k to, to zero. All right, so what is the value? Let's compute what is the value. Let's do a binary string here. 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, sub 2. Right here, so we've indicated that we have, what do we have here? We have an eight digit binary number, right? This is base two, we've explicitly indicated that it's base two, it's sub two. 
right, so we can expand this out using our right, right, using our, our definition of um, of this polynomial expansion for integers. Right, so starting at I will just simply skip the seven and six digit and we'll go to the fifth digit. Right, this is one times two to the five right, plus and that's this digit one times two to the four and that's the fourth digit plus zero times two to the three plus one times two to the two plus one times two to the one and then our last digit plus zero times two to the zero. Right. All right, you can add this up. You get two to the five is 32 plus 16 plus eight plus four and plus two. Two times two times two. Right, this is zero though, we're not right, we're not adding that one up. Plus zero. And then so we add this up one, you get forty eight fifty fifty four. Did I do that right? And that's fifty four, of course, base ten. Oh, if I write it this way, this is 54. If I write 5 and 4, then, then that's, I mean, I'm writing a base 10. If I write it out this way, right, if we write out 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, then it's, and this is base 2. We'll do one more example. We'll do a base 8 example. Yeah. What's that? Okay. Right, yeah, we had a zero in front of uh, this coefficient, right? Right. right so that one's going to be zero. All right. All right. So what is, let's compute 167 base 8. So what is this in decimal? And again, we need only expand this out, and this is simply 167 base 8 is equal to 1 times it's 8 to the 2 plus 6 times 8 to the 1 plus 7 times 8 to the 0. This is 64 plus... 48 plus 7 119 these are all 10 right note here that each digit Right, it's going to range between 0 and b minus 1, where b is the base. Right, I'll cram in one more example here so you guys can see an example of a hexadecimal number. Right, note that if we have base 16 and hexadecimal, right, we need to have 16 digits ranging from 0 to 15 before you carry over to the, not the tens digit, but the 16th digit. Right, we don't have that many single numeric digits. Right? We just have 0 through 9 because we almost always deal with base, right, base 10. And so to account for this, we have numbers 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15 being six single digits, which we, repre which we represent using A, B, C, D, E, and F. All right, so to write out a hexadecimal number, you will often see a few letters ranging up to between A and F. All right, so for example, we might have 1, 3, A, F, and this would be base 16. Again, A is 10. B is 11, C is 12, and so on and so forth. 
right? We need single digits up to 15 because we carry over to the 16th digit right, once we reach 16 or a value greater than that. Right, so what is this in decimal? Right, again, we have the, the same concept here. Here we have 1 right, times 16 to the 3 plus 3 times 16 to the 2 plus right, a is 10 times 16 to the 1 plus f is 15 times 16 to the 0. Right. I think when all is said and done, this is going to be 5,039. All right, again, in base 10, we have digits from 0 to 9, and then we go to the, the tenth digit. We need a two-digit number to represent the base value or greater. Same with 16. We need single digits to represent the number 0 to 15, and so we use the digits A to F to account for this. All right. Enjoy your break. I will see you on Wednesday. Remember, homework number six is due on Wednesday.